as well. Cool. So I think we're live. Uh, welcome back again on our uh, weekly webinar. Uh, Jesse Miller, Team Tim, only half Team Tim this week. Uh, uh, Tim Golden may jump in at some times, but uh, he, he had a family emergency. Um, if you know him closely, you're probably aware of that, but um, hopefully he jumps in here in a bit. But Get the theme of these this, these webinars is really focusing on using cybersecurity to increase revenue, um, specifically the people and processes uh, aspects of um, cybersecurity. Certainly, uh, technology is uh, you're usually the focus of a of typical MSB, and they and they there's plenty of tools to uh, fill your stack with. Um, but uh, you know, just going to continue the conversation this week, really. Brought in a friend of mine, Brian Gillette. Um, if you want to introduce yourself and and our and our other host Jesse, will will we'll reintroduce himself as well. So, sure, yeah, uh, I'm Brian. Tim and I met I don't know a year ago uh, because there's a whole lot of people talking about cyber, and but there's very few people talking about cyber in ways that don't drive me nuts. <laughs> and so it seems like those of us who actually want to propel the cyber conversation forward in the MSP and MSSP space, it feels like we all just kind of find each other, right? We're like the wallflowers in the big party of like, let's tool this thing to death. But then some of us are like, wait, but let's make sure it works. So anyway, we met some time ago, found each other and we've been um, kind of partners ever since. But I'm a sales and sales infrastructure consultant. I specialize in helping sort of low seven figure MSPs create scalable sales process. Yeah, some phenomenal workshops. Uh, if you haven't met Brian, please check them out. Uh, Jesse. Well, yeah. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome back. I'm Jesse Miller, in case you didn't know, uh, I'm with Power PSA Consulting, uh, and we help MSPs uh, build and scale security programs. And so I'm excited to talk to Brian today and really get his take from the sales perspective. Uh, we mentioned last week, last week how I kind of pick off where sales and marketing leaves off. So uh, talking RevOps and making repeatable processes for turning deals over quickly and then uh, helping to build security operations at scale uh, for MSPs to make money after they've made the sale. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Great to, great to be back. Um, I didn't introduce myself, but Tim Schnur for Mesa, um, we are a, um, compliance platform, but also a vulnerability management and risk and asset management, uh, platform as well, really trying to, um, enable and upscale, uh, MSPs to sell, sell, you know, sell cybersecurity in varying SKUs as opposed to kind of one, all in package. Uh, not that that's not an option, but that's kind of what we're up to. So um, why don't we jump in this week, Brian? Uh, you know, I have a couple slides here, but uh, really talking about cybersecurity objection handling, right? Between the MSP and the uh, customer. Um, but before I jump in, um, anything you, you kind of want to like, I guess, discuss first, so. Yeah. Um, well, I want to say we can see people can comment and stuff, right? We can we can see comments on the LinkedIn event. Mm -hmm. If you're watching um, and if you have some sales specific frustrations with cyber, uh, it feels like every time I talk to an MSP, they've they've everybody has a current horror story of some client who they're trying to communicate something to them and they just don't seem to be the customer just doesn't get it. But anyway, if you have a really hard question about like, how am I going to sell this? How am I going to crack this nut of this cybersecurity thing? I would love if somebody just put it in there and derailed us and that we could just talk, we could just answer their question. Right. Yeah, um, absolutely. I would love if somebody had a question that was so hard that the three of us couldn't answer it. I feel like that would be a success. <laughs> um, so throwing that out there. But yeah, uh, what I want to say about cyber is there's a lot of people who have a ton of materials on how to sell cyber. And it seems like it, it all breaks down to the things that you have to do before the cyber sale and then the things you need to do sort of after they say no, <laughs> you know, um, 
And I think that I want to talk a little bit today, if we have time, I, just, I don't know how much time we have to cover this stuff, but like, I'd love to talk about both. What do you do before a cyber sale, during a cyber sale, after a cyber sale? Because of course, there's all this client positioning and all that kind of stuff, you know, that you have to do. But again, if anybody has, if you're joining us on chat, great to see you. I'm Brian, feel good MSP. If you have a cyber sales question and you want to like put us through our paces and see if the three of us can actually come up with something meaningful, just put it in the chat and test us, right? I'm sure Jesse's got, could answer those questions. This is the first time we've met, but <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. Uh-oh, no, I, I really want to echo what you said about, um, you know, what you do when they say no. And that, that's something that I immediately wanted to bring up when I saw the topic for today. Uh, you see it scrolling on the screen down below. It's too expensive. And I really think that if you've done your proper process in terms of evaluating uh, the deal and evaluating the prospect and educating the prospect properly, if they say it's too expensive, you've missed something along the way. And you're mm -hmm. already you've already made a mistake somewhere. So I, I don't know, Brian, if, if you want to comment on that, but I, I feel that that's almost a misnomer is we shouldn't be hearing that, you know? So, right. Yeah. It's an interesting point. I think, I think, I think I can make a great argument for or against what you just said, and I'm going to, I'll do both in the agreement. Yes. I agree that if we, if there's no context around what we sell as a whole, I mean, that's, that's true about all managed services. If you don't contextualize managed services, then people go 180 a seat for wait for you don't don't you just make sure my just send me my email password when I forget it and right give me a new monitor like I don't get it what do I need you for um it, and the same with cybersecurity when they go wait hang on aren't aren't you just gonna change my passwords and don't, yeah. don't I just I see the little icon malware bytes it's all I already have it I thought I am cyber secure <laughs> so, it, yeah. it, it sounds like know. we're getting to the you know, not the why, right? Like you're trying to sell something, but you haven't explained kind of the purpose of it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you're selling early, maybe or you're selling to the wrong person or the wrong frame of mind too early, then it's too expensive is probably your fault. Mm -hmm. I think I could also make the argument though, that I think if we're doing our job in like pushing a client in the direction they need to go, I think we're supposed to get some objections from them along the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like they, they, I think that they should go, okay, Jesse, I understand what you're saying. Are you sure I can't just do this? Yeah. Um, you yeah. know what I mean? Are you sure? But hang on. I, I've got WebRoot. I already, and I already bought it for the year. I think I'm yeah. secure now, Yeah. you know? And yeah. I, this computer has Windows 10 Pro. So I think that's, I think that I'm secure mm -hmm. or, you know, I, I'm being reductive on purpose. Uh, but I think that we are supposed to be pushing the envelope in terms of like cybersecurity is not a destination per se, right? Now, compliance, you're either compliant or you're not compliant. But I don't like the idea of commoditizing cybersecurity into a, a singular, like, okay, I paid Tim 10,000 bucks and now I'm secure forever. Right. Like, of course, yeah. that isn't true. Yeah. But we see a lot we of. Aren't a lot Careful. of services, right? Like that pen testing, um, you know, assessments, right, Jesse, right? Where like, yeah. I just need to get this done. It's a certification I can hang on the wall. I'm all set, right? Yeah. And that's not the case. So, yeah. I, uh, Brian, it's funny. Hearing you talk, I'm like, yep, we're going to be friends. Because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because that's exactly what I was going to say is they shouldn't be saying it's too expensive, but they should be telling you that in other ways. Like you said, like picking apart, like, ah, well, do I really need this part of it? Or explain this piece more to me. And I think that's an opportunity. When you're getting that, they're invested, right? They they want it. You, They're just trying to make it the most economical for themselves. And I think they that's fair. They should do that. But I think then you're in a good position to start explaining and educating better. So yeah, I agree with what you said there. And I really, it's funny because I was going to bring that up. So yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's normal, right? Like I just saw somebody on Tech Tribe said something the other day. We were talking about, there was a threat, threat about price. And they said, if you are good at what you do, you will never hear the price objection. And I was like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Because the person who said this, it tells me one of two things. Either A, they haven't actually sold managed services in 20 years. Right. Since back all when all it took was tape on your glasses and a pocket protector, and then they'd pay you whatever you wanted. Mm -hmm. 
or this person <laughs> is way undercharging. Like, yeah, if you're $40 a seat for all you can eat, then yeah, you're probably never going to hear prices too high. Right. But right. if you're doing what you're supposed to and charging what you're worth, customers should be like, whoa, okay, that is a lot of money. That's expensive, which is another way of saying, what do I get and do I really need it? Those are those are good questions. That's right. And I think, you know, you, you've probably heard this before too, but they they always say when you when you tell when you finally deliver the price, there should be an audible gasp in the room. <laughs> right. That's what I've heard on the other side of the spectrum there, right? So yeah. um, but but that's that's the thing is that you want you don't you don't want to be nickel and diming, so to speak. You want to come with your full stack, everything that you think the client should have, and then yeah, we can talk budget at that point. Um, but it's working in a, and it's peeling things off rather than trying to add them on, which is we all know is e one is easier than the other. So. Yeah, sure. Look at We're jumping questions. ahead here. I, I'm going to add some of these slides as well. Um, great. If I can share this. I know. Can you guys see that? We can see it <laughs> and we can. See, yes. Uh, loading. Awesome. Um, so there a couple slides go. in here and I, I think these are for the for the normal ones and a lot of the things you guys are talking about kind of align with some of these themes that we, you know, we discussed a little bit before, but these are some of the four main objections. Uh, shockingly, I don't know why I didn't think of cost or we didn't talk about cost, but um, first is like, are you the right person, right? Is the MSP, I think we kind of skipped this, right? So like, you know, who do I trust with security? Clearly like I'm managing your IT, like they're gonna call me when they need when they need you know security right so, um you notice the inspector gadget like I do everything right I can cover all your bases right <laughs> so um I don't know yeah I think we talked about this last week Jesse but you know um just because you have that trusted IT relationship doesn't mean that all of a sudden you have a regulatory burden or um a third party due diligence questionnaire or a cybersecurity questionnaire that like they're necessarily the cybersecurity questionnaire they're probably going to give it to you but you're not necessarily the right answer for cybersecurity right like they're constantly getting inundated with uh email junk mail spam whatever even even vendors get get the same <laughs> get the same kind of inbound so mm -hmm. um how do you you know how do you uh I, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm skipping ahead here, but like, how do you credential yourself? Right? Like, how do you, how do you gain that? Uh, th they know I do all these things um, mm -hmm. right off the bat. Right. So I think we're, we've already skipped ahead, Brian, the, the fact that like, when it comes to cybersecurity, am I the right choice? Um, yeah. So that's really good. I mean, I have thoughts. Am I cutting in line, Jesse? No, go ahead. Go I want to. I'm. I'm going to tee off of your off of you here. So cool. <laughs> yeah, for it. clean up. Just clean up whatever I whatever I say wrong. <laughs> um, by the way, Brindis and Rob and Hendrick. I'm seeing some people commenting. I see those comments. You guys ask questions. Yeah, I, I am going to answer them. I promise. But thanks for chatting. And anybody else who's on, throw some really hard questions at us and see if you can just stump us and make us go. We have no idea how to solve that. Um, so the topic of you're, you're saying credentialing on this slide, the topic of establishing authority, let's say it that way. Mm -hmm. um, it is, there is a paradox in when we, we try to communicate to our customers that cyber is that there's like, uh, how do I say this? That adding the complexity or the value of our stack and adding our cyber stack means like now we're upping the level. So, hey, I'm gonna charge you 50 bucks a seat more with this package because there's all this more stuff on there. So what we're really saying to them is like, cyber is another thing. It's not, managed services does not equal cybersecurity as a whole. Just because I'm your MSP doesn't necessarily mean I'm the perfect person to sell you all cyber products. But then we oftentimes come in with the assumed authority because we have an incumbent relationship, which is which is oxymoronic. like. We tell them it's worth all this more money and there's all these other tools. And then we tell them like, well, but it's really no big deal. I should just do all this for you. Don't, don't worry about it. So, I mean, we have to establish, like I have this sales matrix. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm shooting an ad later today. I'll give you guys the spoiler of what the ad is, but I, I built a sales matrix with four quadrants, the quadrants being relationship, expertise, empathy, and authority. 
And how the question is like, how do you sell? How do you put it in the middle? How do you put your sales process in the middle where you actually get all of those things? And a lot of times people will overcorrect in the tune of authority. And the way they do that is by trying to scare the shit out of their customers. Right. Like, I'm going to shock you. I'm going to make up a number and say every day you're taking a million dollar risk because you don't have me. And that's why you need to pay me 300 bucks a seat and I'll figure out what I sell you later. But just, you got to sign this hurry, dear God, you're, you know, we scare them and it's overemphasizing authority, but it's underemphasizing empathy and relationship. Mm -hmm. Like you might get a sticker shock sale. Best case scenario, your customer gets afraid and panic buys from you. Worst case scenario, you completely ruin your reputation and your trust is all the way back down to square one. Cause you're still, at, yeah. you're still not getting at the why you're just saying like the end result, right? Like this, like FUD, you know, this, right. right. This like, I'm going to scare the crap out of them. I'm going to show them their vulnerabilities. I'm going to show them their dark web scans. I'm going to show them like, Oh, your passwords are out on the internet. Like it's only a matter of time before like you get the ransomware notice, right? Like, um, but it never right. talks about like, Oh, you have this data, you're in this business. And like, this is subject to like, you know, it's, it's exposed because you're doing it this way, right? Like you're never really talking, you're never really sh like showing your expertise, I guess, or like right. comfortably yeah. having a conversation that like they're actually going to be interested in, right? Like it actually talks about their business, right? <laughs> right? right. Like yeah. um, real risks to their business, right? As opposed to, oh yeah, like one in five businesses get hacked and it's, it, the average cost right. of an attack is $87,000, whatever. Right. And, and those things actually, I'll say it this way, when it's couched with a sense of connection and empathy, those statistics are incredibly helpful. Right. You know, when you're, right. you know, when your lawyer who you've worked with for a really long time starts to tell you about the risks that you have, you take it really serious. But, you know, a commercial of, have you been injured in a fall? You know, like we don't take that guy serious. <laughs> Right. Because right. you have no relationship with that person. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. yes, you have to have relationship in order to sort of justify or contextualize a lot of the real stakes. Because, of course, I'm not saying you should keep your customers ignorant to their risk. In fact, there was a really good question earlier. I think we should circle back to when we get time of like, how do you tell a customer who's on fire that they're on fire when they don't know they're on fire? Right. right. Of course, like our job is not to hide them from the truth, but selling with FUD, fear, uncertainty and doubt. To say that FUD is the most effective way of selling cybersecurity is like mm -hmm. saying stealing a car is the most effective way of getting a free car. Like, okay, great. You got a free car. It doesn't mean you should have done it or that it was ethical. Yeah. It just means you got it. Okay. You're in the car now, but how long are you going to have that car until somebody freaking catches on to you that you're a crook? So sometimes they need to be, they do need to be let, let into the reality of the risk that they're taking. But if you're leading and the entire relationship is built on you shocking them and them reacting, mm -hmm. you're not going to get long term authority, expertise, relationship and empathy in that relationship. You know what I mean? You're going to you're going to get some quick wins, sell some stuff. Anyway, that's some of my yeah. thought. Yeah. I, yeah. Just a just quick piggyback on that is, you know, the empathy and the EQ is huge because you have to know who you're talking to. And you have to know the type of business you're talking to and you have to know the role within that business that you're talking to. And if you're not clear on all those things and what buying triggers are for all those people and what drives those people, what they're interested in, and you're not speaking to those things, as you said, those statistics don't mean anything. And you might as well just be, you know, again, yeah, yelling, <laughs> yelling as the, the ambulance chaser on the commercial. So right. I think uh, having and you have different playbooks for that. Right. So are you talking to a current customer? Are you talking to a prospect? Are you talking to a small business with under 50 people? Are you talking to an SME with 500 people and growing? What kind of business are they in? Are they heavily manufacturing? I mean, there's a wide variety of different approaches that you need to understand for the kind of customer you're talking to. And that speaks back into defining your ICP and making sure that you have a narrow focus in terms of what you're going after. So you can really specialize in those things and specialize in the conversations and in the, the rev ops piece of the playbook and delivering those those things effectively and managing the sales cycle for the most success. 
So uh, yeah, just kind of adding on there. Yeah. Some great comments here. Um, knowing and understanding your customer's industry and their compliance requirements before starting the conversation, obviously great, right? Like, um, you know, it's a medical, is it, is it K through 12, right? What, what, what are you involved with here? Um, some other comments uh, and, and great point, Jesse, on empathy, empathy, you never lose with empathy, right? Like if you put yourself in their situation, um, if you talk them through, you know, some of the comments we have on the slide here, right? Like education, um, news and marketing, like why are uh, car dealers getting hit with like wire fraud charges or like why are, why is cyber insurance like so expensive, right? Like some of that storytelling and education is a phenomenal way to credential yourself mm -hmm. and gain trust, right? So right. Um, any other comments right. here you guys want to pick off and, and kind of address I, and keep them coming I, in? I, I just appreciate wanna... it. I just want to put a quick pin on that or a, a quick like point on the idea that in my sales process, so our, the sales process that we use is called the feel good close. Uh, we build, I always say we build rapport by focusing on the solution mm -hmm. and you build authority by demonstrating empathy. There's like that super cheesy phrase that is so incredibly true. Nobody knows how cares how much, you know, until they know how much you care. But if you come in with, you come in guns a blazing, like, oh my God, there's a 50% chance you're going to get hacked. Hurry, sign. You're not building relationship. But if you also overemphasize relationship, to, AKA you're afraid of telling people things they don't want to hear, mm -hmm. then you're compromising your authority. Yeah. So of course you have to have the balance of both, but it, authority comes from empathy. If they're like, I know that Tim actually cares about my well-being, I will care a lot more about what he has to say regarding my cybersecurity. Yeah. But if I don't have that sense of trust, Tim is just the next guy yelling at me about like trying to take the money that I have for IT for his little product. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how good it is, doesn't matter what your stats are, it will everything that you say will continue to drive the wedge between you and them because it's not built on the foundation of actual trust. So we have to start with trust and trust is the multiplier of your authority. Then when you give specific calculated and contextualized advice and critique to your clients, they, it goes so much farther. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you both agree? Any yeah. thoughts there? Absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, you, you know, the old saying, um, the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. Then the second best time is today. Well, it's similar with building trust and with your clients. You know, you, you can't expect it to happen overnight. And the, the add on to that is when you plant the tree today, you can't expect it to be 10 feet tall tomorrow. So it's yeah. a slow, methodical process that you have to start doing and start building with your clients. Um, you know, so that's that's I would add on to that piece is that you have to be patient. There's a little bit of patience. That's, you know, you've got yourself here. <laughs> You're going to have to take a little bit of time to get yourself out. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think this kind of runs into the other objection. Security just isn't my number one priority today. Like same thing, like you just don't understand their business. you you haven't educated them. You you've already skipped ahead of like selling some widget, whatever. I don't want to call it a widget, but you know, vendor yeah. products out there, crowded landscape, right? Like there's a picture here from inception, right? Like you've got to really deeply understand the customer deeply understand them right three levels deep right? <laughs> yes and it's got to be their idea right like as you said like as brian said earlier if they're coming to you and they're like oh i'm worried i'm worried about that because you told me about the story or you educated me on like you know consumer data like i, I don't want to take a reputational hit on my business like mm -hmm. um you want it you want them to like drive you, you you just can't constantly be selling them uh point solutions one after another mm -hmm. so yeah um, there was another comment from Rob, uh, Carcio, uh, if it's too expensive, um, sometimes it's a result of the pricing model that has no room for something this size and short the customer is already hooked on the price. And the MSB doesn't want to add costs to the stack. Right. So I think we talked about a little bit this last week, Jesse, but like, it's, a, it's obviously a challenge when you've had, uh, like relatively, um, consistent pricing and all of a yeah. sudden, you know, you're you're kind of going into the compliance world and the compliance is very, um, it's going to be, there's not a ton of automation for some things like people and processes and governance 
right? And like having these conversations, it's, it's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, hourly wages or you know to be paid or or, mm -hmm. or deployed there and planned for. So, um, do you want to talk about that? Like, how do you how do you you know you you go into a new a new partner, right? A new MSC partner, and how do you mm -hmm. How do you get them to approach that uh, challenge, right? Like, because this customer just become comfortable with that, whatever price per seat. Hopefully it's not yeah. $40 a seat, Brian, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think Brian's exactly right, is that, you know, that's when you're on that side of too much relationship, you know, wow, we just want to do right for the customer. And it's really just a cover for that. They're scared to go ask the customer for what they deserve, right? Yeah. And so you, you have to take that leap and you have to know what you're worth. Right. So that, that there's other things built into that understanding what uh, value you're delivering and things that we, you know, I don't want to get too far into today. But uh, to answer your question, going into a partner that needs to have this conversation. I mean, you know, I always say you got to treat it as a launch. Like it's it's got to be a planned thing where something big is coming. We've heard you. Many of you are asking about security and then setting meetings with every single one of your clients. Right. To talk about security and then delivering a risk assessment to every single one of your clients and trying to get them to pay for it. Now, you might not get them all to pay for it, but you should still know enough about their environment that you can deliver a risk assessment and give them a risk score. And that addresses several things. Number one, it shows them that you are delivering security value through your MSP services because you show them you'd be at 90% risk without patching BDR and things like that. So you're down to 70, but you're still at 70. And that addresses, we thought you were doing these things for us, right? No, we were doing some things for you, but we weren't doing them all. And so we see you at 70 and we like to see you at 30 to 40. Here's the Delta. Here's what it's going to take to get you there. Now let's talk about budget. Let's start planning and let's start executing against that. And it, then that goes into a cycle that can take a year to get through that. But you're slowly moving the customers into, hey, we didn't make this world, but we're living in it with you and we're trying to make you secure. And so that's that's kind of the, the high level view of the process I think you should take. And I think it's it was very successful in the programs that I've been implemented it in. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, a parallel comment here, I think, uh, to me, trusted advisor is the end goal of any business relationship. Trust is a two way street, but you as the MSP vendor are trying to earn their trust. It's theirs to grant as they do choose. You can't make it happen. Yeah. Nurture it. Make it happen. Right. Um, yeah. So and and I'll process. Yeah. 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 And I'll, I'll just say one more thing about that. I mean, this is anecdotal, right? Because this is the programs that I've run and the, the uh, programs that I've been a part of. But Pretty much any client that's above a 90 in my risk assessment model is going to end up with ransomware. I mean, that's anecdotally, that's what's happened, <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> you, sound like a, you sound like a great insurance adjuster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of, I mean, there is a piece to that, right? Um, yeah. And then the clients that were in, in that uh, 90 to 70 range that didn't want to do anything additional, they end up with like a BEC or compromised email and their clients are getting malware from their, it's a more of a reputation hit. Nobody wants that. And that can end up, you know, costing you money through wire fraud and things like that. Uh, but the clients that did take that advice and got down into that 30 to 40 range, I put a post out on LinkedIn today about it. Um, saw another post that reminded me of it. I can't believe I didn't think about this, but uh, we had a client who was uh, years ago when I built my first uh, MSSP program for uh, for the company I was working at. Uh, we had a client who took our advice, put in like a, a ZTNA and SASE approach. Uh, they were SEC regulated, so they were very you know forward thinking. Did cloud hardening, uh, and they they wanted to put cybersecurity into their uh, mergers and acquisitions. So we did that. We had uh, an acquisition they were making, who we. Uh, we told them, you know, hey, this company has a lot of red flags. Don't connect your systems to theirs until they sort some things out and we'll work to get that done. Well, three days after we made that recommendation, this incoming company got hit with ransomware and it would have spread through the whole network had they connected it, but they didn't. And they were, <laughs> there was almost no, uh, there was almost no effect on the company because they already had new laptops on the way for these users. Um, the users took the laptops, connected them to a clean network hooked into the SASE network, were up and working. They took all the old servers, the old laptops that had ransomware, stuck them in uh, a closet for the IR team until they got there and kept on with their day. And that was the, they had to report obviously, and there was some fallout there, but almost no downtime with, because of just taking a few steps. And would that have happened if you had been the trust, if you hadn't been the trusted advisor with that client and pushed them to make those changes? No. So that's a Brown, great story. That's yeah, yeah, that's a great story. Process and policy, about. right? What's the policy on M and A? Yeah, yeah. Well, how do we onboard these guys? Sounds like you nailed it. So, 
Uh, Craig, thanks for jumping on. Thanks for the comments in here. Uh, another co another comment before, um, uh, and this is this Jesse can answer this one. I'm um, in a parallel industry. Um, in our space, we're less successful with IT, more successful with customer experience management. In the C-suite, I'm curious. The same is true. Uh, and he says, "Is the sorry um, the CISO your sales target?" And I, I think we can answer that. Most of the small business clients don't have a CISO, right? right. So. Right. Yeah. Um, it's a that's that goes back though to I have worked with CISOs and worked as a VC so like in a uh, advisory capacity in larger organizations. So it goes back to understanding what does a CISO want versus what does the business owner want. So it's a completely different dynamic when when you're in those scenarios. Um, yeah, you know, I, I'd like to actually hear from uh, hear more about uh, a new sales process from from Brian though. Like, how do you how do you approach getting into a new sales process and talking cybersecurity with a client and MSP services? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Jesse, by sorry, least... before you jump into that, one more was like, oh yeah, percentage of typical <laughs> sale process involved the education importance of cybersecurity. It sounds like it's like you know, it's if you don't do that right, like you're not going to get to the sale. So. I actually was going to say, I saw that comment. I was like, I hope you, I hope we can talk about that comment. And that might be a pretty good segue. Yeah. Um, yeah 4% of the typical sales process involves this education of the importance. It seems to be heard a lot of industries don't find themselves facing. Yeah. So um, if we zoom out for a second on this, the topic of like, how do I sell cybersecurity? Okay. Cybersecurity, this industry is a very young industry, right? Like cyber insurance is super young. That's why they lost all the cyber insurance vendors lost their ass for years and years because they were like, oh man, we shouldn't have been writing any of these policies. <laughs> and they over buckled down and then they vilified the MSPs. And now there's still the tension there. But cybersecurity, you see what I'm saying? Like this isn't a hundred year old industry. This industry is still evolving. Most of the tools, I don't know what the percentage is, but most of the tools that MSPs have in their cybersecurity arsenal are like less than five years old mm -hmm. and 80 percent of them are tooled for acquisition anyway so they're all like little <laughs> you know what i mean they're like we're filling our quivers with all these little random arrows yes. to be like okay i'm going to try to be ready for any individual situation but now here we all are in this echo chamber about the importance of cybersecurity, and you zoom out and it's like the the msp and mssp industry is like a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean mm. with this big Boom, tika boom, tika boom, tika boom. Yeah, cyber, cyber. We're gonna sell cyber. <laughs> you cut wide, and you just see a little cruise ship, right, floating in the middle of the ocean, while everybody else is going, "What the hell are they talking about? <laughs> What's going on out there?" You know, yeah. and we all come back like, "Whew, what a great seminar, <laughs> or what a great <laughs> week I spent in Vegas learning about this stuff that my customers aren't going to understand for twenty years." Yeah. It, it becomes so I'm going to use this word. It's it's almost masturbatory. A lot of the <laughs> efforts that we put into selling cybersecurity when we zoom out and realize that, like, if the customer doesn't know what we're talking about, it's a completely useless, fruitless conversation. Right. So in now in comes the customer where we have to slowly but surely educate them about all these problems that they didn't know exist, problems that didn't exist five years ago. Right. New risks every day that are causing risk to their business that they actually really need to care about, but they don't care about them yet. Hold that yeah. thought as well, that the new risks, I think that's where Rob asked that question before. I'm like, I've got a flat price and like, well, the world changed, technology changed, right? Like, right. so, you know, this is why we're having this conversation. Like, I, I wish, you know, <laughs> I wish I could pay a dollar for gas forever, but that's just not reality, right? So. Right. And that's why I said cybersecurity sales can't be a destination like mm -hmm. that conversation, that little sales hook. Th that's how we all started. That's why all these vendors got a little market share by saying, buy this agent and every and then you've checked the I am secure and my clients are secure box. Right. And now we're all realizing like, OK, well, that a that was never true. B, now that's super not true because that's dated. Uh, <laughs> or whatever, you know, um, and now we all have to go, well, actually, that isn't true anymore. And they go, but OK, so now is the next thing you're going to say true or are you going to keep like we've got to change the conversation from buy this thing for me and then we'll never have to talk about cyber again. You can't sell that way. You're shooting yourself in the foot. You need to say, look, this is an evolving science because every day there's new threat actors 
creating new ways to try and screw you. Like our job is we have to keep amassing power and defenses and research and you've got to keep spending. You just, you can't spend on cyber one time, right? Right. It's just not, it's not realistic. So I want to circle all the way back to Derek's question of like, okay, what percentage of the sales process? Um, the mistake I'm seeing really, really consistently because I've coached like, a, I coached like a hundred MSPs or something like that last year in my one or in, in, in these intimate small groups. And a lot of people are like, I know I need to educate my clients, but that is a massive daunting task. So I'm going to get some syndicated content. I'm going to get the pictures of the guy in the hoodie with the matrix behind him. And I'm going to throw it on my LinkedIn. And I'm just going to assume that people are reading this, digesting it and evolving their understanding of the topic. I'll do that for 12 months and then I'll call them again. That's not going to happen. No, your customer. And I mean this, they do not care what's inside of that article. And I mean this with love. They're never going to read that article. Yeah. Because we have to contextualize educating and evolving our customers understanding of their need inside of an existing relationship. That's where the QBR or the TBR or the customer webinars mm -hmm. or like, can you, can you make this education valuable to them in a way that they perceive as valuable? Can you make it entertaining in a way yes. that they will actually watch it or read it? Yeah. Can you make it worth something to them? Right? Like, other than saying you're going to be at lower risk if you do all this stuff, like it's just, it's just not, it's not good enough. Right. And the proof that it's not good enough is that you've been doing it for two years and you've so, and you haven't sold any of your cybersecurity services and you've tried it 24 times and changing what's in the stack is not the problem. It's the narrative as a whole. We have to zoom out and we need to have the empathy in our industry to realize nobody's ever going to care about this as much as we do. But they're the ones with everything to lose. So how can I make it matter to them that they're that they have risk in a way that isn't trying to shock them, but is pushing them slowly in the right direction? Like you were saying, Jesse, I think that's the perfect way to think of it. Like push them in the right direction. Give yourself a modular approach to cybersecurity. Yeah. Yeah. That also answers the question of what ha how, what happens if you get stuck on price? Like. Right. No, this is, this is evolving. This is changing. And today, here's what we can do. We can do what's cutting edge today. And what we are currently doing in your environment, cutting edge 14 months ago. Yeah. Yeah, I had a, I, this is great because I had a meeting actually with a client. Um, they're, they're actually getting an MSP started um, in the EU of all places. The internet is wild, right? How you can get <laughs> clients across the ocean. But um and I was talking through them, helping them build, you know, their cyber stack out as as part of their different tiers of their MSP uh, package. And I was saying, you know, you need to include. They're like, which should I include VC so services with of my cyber of my different packages? I said all of them. <laughs> like, right. if you, you <laughs> if you're not getting in front of, you, and they said, well, you know, aren't we? Aren't he's like, well, but what are we going to talk about? Like, can I just do the stuff? I'm like, no, you got to get in front of your client at least once a quarter and talk through these things in a strategic fashion and update them and educate them. And I walked him then through one of my template reports, you know, that, I, that I've used in the past and, and saw the light bulb came on. He's like, oh, okay, that makes sense now. But I, you know, I think that initially he was like, yeah, I don't need to do that. I'm just going to do the right thing. And it's, uh, you, you hit on something, Brian, that I tell people it's uh, one thing to do a really good job and it's another to actually prove it to the client. <laughs> so yes. those, there's two different things right there. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of, lot of really good nuggets you had there. Yeah. Con con context is huge, right? Like that you putting it in their business sense, like making, if it's storytelling, it better be like very close to their business, like close to home. Um, so yeah, no, awesome nuggets there, uh, Brian. Uh, Matthias, um, Matthias, I think I'm saying it right. Uh, appreciate the comments, keep them coming. He's like, I want to be on that cruise ship, uh, Brian. Brian's <laughs> alive in time. So, uh, Matthias, Matthias is a good guy, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah the cruise ship sounds super yeah. fun, right? It's yeah. like, he's, awesome. I'll be, I'll be on that cruise ship with you, man. Yeah, yeah look, obviously, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna yeah. be there. Obviously, yeah, I'm gonna be on the dance floor with my little drink bracelet on. It's super fun. But, but my point is, we shouldn't be shocked when we come off right. the cruise ship and we go, "I had the best vacation," and our clients go, "I don't care." 
<laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's <laughs> trust me, you got to buy. You know what? You just said something, Jesse. Like, where where should I put VC so services in? Isn't that interesting that cyber is now the like platinum tier? Right. And yet it's also the thing we're telling our customers, like, this is the thing you need more than anything. <laughs> but it's the last thing I'm going to sell you. Yeah. That is a huge mistake to make, by the way. Right. This 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 client I was talking with, that's what they had. They're like, oh, our platinum tier has all the cyber stuff. And I'm like, no, no, no. We got to distribute that out through all the packages. And then let's talk about what takes more and what the platinum customers are really going to want. Like, right. is your 30 person MSP going to want a full fledged vulnerability management package? No, but your midsize, you know, 500 person company sure will. So you, you want that in your platinum package then. And, but it's got to be a graduated thing uh, about leading the customer the right way again. Uh, Tim laughs because I, I own a little hobby farm. And so I'm always posting about my animals and things like that. But we, we got a new cow recently. Yeah, the cow this is an awesome story. <laughs> Brian, you got to follow Jesse, but this is a great. OK, hit this, me. This story is the kind of story that you would just have the business owner glue. So, if, he, well, if he was a if he was a farmer, maybe, you know. <laughs> yeah, he would still, you know, who doesn't relate to, you but, know. Well, so so we had this. We bought this new cow. It was a good deal on Craigslist. I saw. I'm like, okay, we're gonna get this cow. We weren't gonna get a cow until next year. But in any case, cow shows up. We put her in the winter pasture, and the food and the water is in the paddock on the other side of the barn. There's a small channel through the fence way behind the barn. She doesn't want to go through that way because she doesn't know what's on the other side. Mm -hmm. So she's scared to move through there because it's the unknown. And so. She, we tried to first we tried fud okay me and my wife got mm -hmm. behind her and and kind of tried to scare her through the thing well my wife almost got trampled because she freaked out and came back uh -huh. the other way so we're like okay fud didn't work we better try something else um so then we you know we had the idea okay we're just going to slowly over time over the week coax her over there so we were hauling water to the other side of the barn and putting the hay there so the first day it was in front of the barn the second day it was by the corner of the barn the third day, yeah. it was halfway up the channel. The fourth day, she stuck her head around the corner, saw the hay and saw this comfortable place to lay and came trotting in and was literally running around in the paddock, kicking her heels because she was so happy. Like, oh, this is awesome. When we finally took the slow steps to lead her over there. And it's so similar to the way trust works in a human relationship. So, Wow. Yeah. And the best part of that, so, so let me bring the psychology piece here. Let me bring the sales expertise. The best part about that story is that cow thinks she discovered something. Yeah, there you go. Right? Yep. She's going to go to all her little rabbit and bunny friends and go, <laughs> you'll never guess what I found. It's a haven. <laughs> you, you probably would have never found it. Super out of the way. Right. Incredible. <laughs> right? Yep, absolutely. It's the hipster on Spotify where Spotify feeds them the artist that it knows that they'll like. And then they go, I found the most bespoke, coolest, hip little artist. I've been following oh, them. It's like yeah. you didn't find it. A robot that knows every single thing about you told you that you would love it, and you did. <laughs> and then you, but the genius is that everybody's favorite idea is their idea. Right, right. So yeah. that's why I loved the Inception example. Like yeah. <laughs> if we can get out of the hero seat, this is how I teach it. Yeah. If you can get out of needing to be the hero of this story, your life will get so much easier yes. and you'll get way more of what you want out of the people you're engaging with. If you just mm -hmm. decide I'm going to be the guide, but they're going to get all the credit for this. Yeah. The yeah. customer is Luke and you're Yoda and risk is Darth Vader. Like, okay, I'm going to teach you how to overcome your risk. Instead of saying I'm Luke, you can be whoever you can be Leia. You can be princess peach. I'll be Mario. <laughs> And I'm going to come and rescue you from this big, bad thing that is that that's stronger than you are, but it's not stronger than me because I'm amazing. Best case scenario, they say, yeah, well, we were in we were in hot water and then I found this guy named Jesse and he totally saved us and it was cool. But it's not really what you want. No, um, you want them to say, wow, I, I was you know, I I was looking at ways to whatever and future proof our business. And then I found this guy. And he's really helped us a lot. And I think you would, he would help you too. Yeah. That's what the cow says to the rabbit and bunny friends. So yeah. now the ra the rabbits, now they're all going to the water and the hay because the cow said, I came up with something and is motivated to actually encourage people to come along. Right. So the psychology, we've talked, we've hinted a lot at these, like, you need to have best practices. I wish we had time to like 
break all the way down how you yeah. actually do all these things. Yeah. Here's the too long didn't read version is the best way to sell cybersecurity is by asking questions, mm -hmm. not by making statements or sell yeah. anything for that matter. Yes. I mean, the, <laughs> the best way to sell anything is by asking yeah. questions. What do you need? Why do you need it? Why don't you have it? It's if you that, figure out how to ask those three questions, you will make more money today. The amount right. of FaceTime you have, I mean, there is a, there are people that would love to talk forever, but there, most of the time, if you, that FaceTime is incredibly valuable, right, Brian? Like right. just right. QBRs is not is not enough. It sounds like Jesse. Like every ninety days is not enough time, and not enough like FaceTime, and not enough question and answer, right? Here's the here's the thing, it, it if if you are having trouble tracking your clients down for your QBRs or your VC sales and they don't show up and they keep pushing it, you know, you have a problem because you're not delivering value, perceived value to them. So that, that's something to really have your finger on the, of the, on the pulse of is, you know, and you could, you could reset that and go into those and say, Hey, what's going to be the most valuable for, for you in these meetings? You know, what's missing the mark and, and, and starting to do some of that. And I know we're getting a little outside the sales into account management there, but I think that's an important thing to understand is you can, it's kind of a health indicator for a client if they're not showing up or not taking your QBRs and VC so seriously. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, there's Tim. Uh, well, we missed you, buddy. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll check in next week with you. Right, Jesse? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. Awesome. Uh, Derek had a quick comment just talking about FUD. And um, I think we kind of answered this, right? Like, how do you how do you not use FUD, right? And, and basically um, make that connection and make that sale. Um, yeah. I don't know if yeah. you read that, Brian, but yeah, yeah that's a, I mean that's a big question. Um, I think to, to try to answer it holistically, but also specifically, I would say um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and value is in the eye of the client. So the mistake salespeople make is that they think they get to tell a customer how much something is worth. But if you say how much it's worth, it doesn't mean anything. If they say how much it's worth, that is going to define whether or not they'll buy it. Right? right? So if I say, this is valuable, this is valuable, this is valuable, this is valuable. They'll go, I believe that you believe this is valuable, but you know, <laughs> we're a different shop, Tim. We're a simple place. You're yeah. selling a Ferrari. All I need is a Corolla. It's not yeah. a high priority for me right now. Yeah. Cause you're trying hey, to keep telling them Mr. Golden in the house. You're hey, telling sorry. Telling them what they need. Hey, Tim. Sorry. So, Brian, go back to FUD. Yeah. Sorry, Tim. Tim, why don't you jump in? But I had one quick comment on FUD. Uh, it sounds like the difference between FUD and like, risk is contextual right like the ability to talk about like specific things in their business that are that could be affected as opposed to being like general statistics right and like having that deep conversation and leading them to water and or, or hay as jesse yeah. said and then the inception <laughs> right like them being like oh i understand that now and i understand like why that's dangerous and what can you what can you implement to mitigate that risk. Right. So go ahead. All right. All right, Tim. Good, good, good seeing you, man. Hey, sorry about that little family crisis happening here at home. Sorry. I'm late, uh, catching the last couple of minutes here, trying to catch up. So thanks for having me, but yeah, <laughs> welcome. Hi everybody. Hey, hey what's it's, our, going on? it's our weekly Friday afternoon. Someone's in the car, hopefully listening to us. Um, so. Brian, I, I wanted to hear you finish out your point there though. I was, I was, I think you were home, circling something there. And so I, I, I'd like to hear that what you're gonna. Yeah, come, what try was the last thing I said? Um, so you were talking about uh, how, geez, I just lost it now. About um, FUD isn't. Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah. There you go. Thank you. Asking yeah. questions instead of and and the value in their eyes. Right. 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 So, um, I mean, the way it, I say, I I have said many times, um, telling somebody that you're going to share value is kind of like telling somebody that you're about to say something funny. It will completely betray. And it's actually not up to you if your joke is funny. It's right. up to the person who's listening to the joke, right? So you would never, a, a good comic would never go, hey guys, I've got this great joke. Listen, I'm about to tell you a joke. I'd love to get three minutes of your time. Trust me, you're going to die. 
You're absolutely going to adore this. Five people this week have laughed at this joke. One of them almost fell out of his chair. Trust me. You're not going to want to miss this. Imagine you set up a joke like that. <laughs> Isn't that how it's done, though? Yeah. If you set up a joke like that, they're going to go like this. Oh, really? And then the best case, they're going to give you a sympathy laugh and go, great joke. You know, I would have punched up this. I would have hit that word a little harder. You mm -hmm. have created an opportunity for them to critique your fu how funny you are mm -hmm. because you told them what they felt and you were wrong. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Don't, so when, don't you think that there's a certain level of FUD that is part of that conversation, right? So, uh, I mean, I can give an example with a prospect that I had today, veterinary practice, looking for help, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, <clears throat> last year when the big thing happened on the 4th of July weekend and all those people got ransomed where uh, there was a veterinary practice right down the street from the prospect I was talking to today who got ransomware. And so I, what I'm getting at is there's an appropriate place and time to be able to share, not FUD, but to be able to share like, yeah, you know, this stuff does happen. Like, and, and when I brought that up in the prospect call, you know, he was like, oh yeah, I remember that. I know them, like we've collaborated. So I think it's not from a FUD factor, but- There's you know, there's context there though, for sure, yeah. right? There's definitely, he knows context. Yeah. Yeah. there's definitely yeah. context. I mean, you're absolutely right. And I think we, we talked about this too earlier in the call that, that um, when you have contextualized your expertise with empathy and relationship, then they're a lot more likely to hear it through the way that they should be hearing it, take it a little bit more seriously. Right. In my mind, the implication, the sort of the tonal implication of FUD is yeah. I'm going to, I mean, one of the, one of the most prominent MSP prospecting as a vent, prospecting as a service vendors, you would know their name. I was at mm -hmm. an event. I was at DattoCon in San Diego a few years ago. The CEO of that company is there. We're all eating whatever, charcuterie or something. And he was talking about how when he grew his MSP, he had a an app on his phone of a, a revolver and you could spin the chamber. Remember when apps were like one thing and everybody yeah. thought it was awesome? <laughs> yeah. And he said he would do, he would stand in silence for 20 seconds and go like this. And then he would say every day that you don't purchase this package. <laughs> You are doing this. I left and I just yelled in my car. I was like, actually, that guy is the reason I started my company. Like, this is the best our industry's got. Right. That is not a sales strategy. That's a gimmick. Mm -hmm. Right. It's yeah, a gimmick. It's and a gimmick. okay, if you want to use gimmicks, great. But hacks are for hacks. Like, if you, it's, you only use a gimmick if you have absolutely no idea what you're doing. Right. So, well, you know, the alternative and what I like to do is make it relatable, right? Use an analogy that they can understand, right? Depending on the prospect that you're having these conversations with, make it relatable. You can pull the fear and the uncertainty and the doubt into those pieces of the conversation, but you need to make it relatable and not gimmicky, not gamey, not revolver, yeah. like, you right. know, that conversation with the prospect this morning. There was an exact situation that happened down the street from him that he knew about that I reminded him. And it basically closed the deal, right? Because yeah. it was relatable, right? Things that we can do and, you know, sales, like I do it. I don't love to do it. I do it. But having those analogies, having those relatable moments, but introducing the risk and introducing yeah. like what what can actually happen is, you know, that's kind of how, how I've always approached it. Like, hey, let's just make it relatable, right? Like, let's, you know, I'm talking to a veterinary practice and our process is we're going to do an assessment. I don't use that word. I use words like, hey, much like you do when you're trying to, you know, diagnose a, a problem with one of your pets or one of your dogs, like, you're not going to tell that that dog owner over the phone what's wrong. You're going to want to do an assessment. You're going to want to evaluate them. That's how we operate. We're going to come in and evaluate what you have going on. We're going to make a diagnosis. We're going to I'm going to use as an MSP 
words that are relatable to their business. Yeah, sure. Right? Automotive dealer, hey, just like you change your oil every month and pay and do maintenance, we're gonna do maintenance every month, not changing your oil every month. Right. Yeah. There's shout out to Heather, another another good gimmick there. <laughs> so but uh we're almost at the top of the hour here and uh Brian, it's been amazing, awesome conversation. And uh I'm glad we kind of went down this direction of you know, FUD, no FUD what risk, you know, how risk differs from FUD. I think that's kind of like what we're getting to, Tim. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, closing thoughts, I, I you know, I, before we before we close out here, um, Jesse, why don't you go and then we'll go around the horn. Yeah, again, I, I'll leave you with my saying that everyone gets tired of hearing me say is it's one thing to do a good job. It's quite another to prove it to the client um, and know who you're talking to, uh, know what they care about, uh, know what kind of company you're dealing with and speak in those terms. Uh, like Tim said, put it, put it in their language. And I think you'll have a lot of success doing that. Tim. Uh, so yeah, sorry again for being late and missing a good portion of it. Um, you, know, you can see on the bottom of the screen, left of boom versus right of boom. I spend a lot of time in left, right? That preparation, that uh, setting the stage so that when boom happens and right of boom happens, you are well prepared, right? And so incident response, all those fun things, right? So uh, next Friday, three o'clock, join us as we talk about left and right of boom tactics. It is something that is near and dear to my heart because for me, I want to help MSPs shift left. Yeah, totally agree. Um, so, uh, Brian, why don't you close out and then uh, we'll uh, we'll end this thing. But sweet, uh, I think a, a takeaway that if you're watching this, if you're selling cyber MSP MSSP, a takeaway move um, that you can a sweep the leg move that can help you that you may consider is when I'm selling cyber or selling managed services to a business, I'm going to say IT is a spectrum. On this side of it is cost. And on this side of it is risk. And you need to decide where you want to stay on this spectrum. If you gave me a million dollars a month, I can pretty much guarantee you'll never click a bad link. You know why? Because I'm going to pay somebody to stand over your shoulder and go, don't click on that. Nope, no, nope, don't click on that. <laughs> if you gave me a million bucks a month, yeah, I could do it. If you gave me 50 bucks a month per user, okay, that means you, you have a bigger appetite for risk at the expense of a lower, in order to achieve a lower cost. So let's figure out if what I sell is in the same spectrum of that, same range of that spectrum as what you're looking for. And that's gonna tell us whether or not we're a good fit. Awesome. <clears throat> Something you Great might stuff. consider. Good stuff. Great, thanks for jumping on again. Uh, Tim, as Tim said, uh, next week, uh, we'll uh, we'll be out with uh, left of boom, right of boom. A um, couple different vendors on the show. Uh, We'll have a, one of our best and favorite customers um, or partners, I should say, of Fort Mesa uh, talking about a little bit how, you know, how they relate in terms of left and right of boom. But, uh, you know, Tim, left of boom is where the, where the money is made. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brian, isn't there some something, a workshop or something you want to? Yeah, there is. Yeah, thanks. We're running a workshop May 15th through 17th. It's um, three 90 minute sessions with me and I keep about 10 MSPs max in that room. And it's all about the feel good clothes. This, the kind of principles I'm talking about today, if it resonates with you, you're going to probably get along. If it doesn't, don't come to the workshop because you won't like it, <laughs> but it's, it's four and a half hours of group training and it's 50 bucks. Feelgoodmsp.com slash workshop or just feelgoodmsp.com. Would love to have anybody so, there. So four 90 minute sessions. So yeah, it's it's three 90 minute sessions for 50 bucks. Okay, take Tim, my money. Tim yeah. signed up. <laughs> Not a lot of money, yeah. That's uh, yeah. kind of a, uh, you know, that's awesome, Brian. So I, I I have been in I have been in one of these sessions and uh I learned a lot from a marketing and sales perspective, cold calling, uh, you know approaching email marketing we just we ha we had a sliver of brian's wisdom today so uh <laughs> jump on one of those if you get a chance 
But top of the hour, guys. Appreciate it again. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Everyone signing off. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you Take next week. Take care, everybody. Thanks for being here.